Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, May 12th edition of the Basement Academy. As we begin our morning, like we do with a psalm, uh, it's a familiar psalm, or it should be for those who've been listening or uh, participating and watching the Basement Academy for some time. Psalm 12, it is one of my favorites, though it's kind of a a funny little favorite. <laughs> it's got some pretty strong language here, but it seems appropriate uh, for the life we're living right now. Psalm 12, for the director of music, according to Sheminith, that's a musical term, a psalm of David. Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Everyone lies to his neighbor. Their flattering lips speak with deception. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says, we will triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? Because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of the needy, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless. Like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. The wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. Mm. Just eight little verses. It begins with this, ah, (laughs) there are none left. (laughs) The godly are no more. And it feels that way. And of course, we always place ourselves amongst the godly, don't we? And we're the persecuted minority and, and the like. But it seems that these days there's so much boasting, people talking, flattery, deception, lies, all this stuff. And, and so I love Psalm 12. It just kind of brings me back. It grounds me again. I want to make sure that my tongue isn't deceitful. My tongue isn't boastful and flattering. But the words of the Lord are flawless. So if in fact the wicked are strutting about because what is vile is honored, let us be faithful. Let me be faithful to the truth, to the word of God, uh, and to what we know, uh, what we know uh, to be of the kingdom through Jesus. So anyway, Psalm 12. James, another little introduction. This is a pastoral letter. We, we often lose sight of that. Uh, we lose sight of really each of the epistles, each of the, 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 past, the, the letters, you know, not the gospels, but the letters are, are really pastoral letters written from the heart of one of God's chosen appointed leaders inspired by the Spirit, the Spirit working through them. Maybe they're not fully aware of that. They're just saying the words that they are prompted in their heart to say. But this letter begins to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, when you're writing to anybody who's scattered, the word behind that is diaspora, the dispersion, dispersed. There's so much loaded just in in those few words right there. So the 12 is suggestive of the 12 tribes of Israel. He uses that language, 12 tribes, but it's suggestive then of the 12 apostles because there's that parallel between the apostles and the tribes. This is the covenant community, old covenant, new covenant community. And so it's suggestive of the church. It's suggestive of that the, the, the people of God following Jesus. Now, James, as an early leader uh, in the church there in Jerusalem, he would have been witness to the scattering, to the persecution that would have come uh, through, uh, would eventually became the apostle Paul, but through Saul. And so the, the very introduction to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations or among the Gentiles, it's this notion of a people that are in tension. They're on the way somewhere, right? Maybe they haven't found a home yet. Um, there, there's a journey that they're uh, engaged in. They're in the middle. And, and this, is, this is what is so... 
how do I say this? This is the quality of our lives. This is the defining quality of our lives. We're always in the middle. We're in the middle of something, right? We're never quite settled. We're always between this and between that. And so to the tribes that are scattered that, that, that James is writing to, they had a home and now they're cast out from that. We don't know where they're all scattered to, but they're in the middle of a story. They're in the middle of a journey. They're in the middle of something that's unfolding, but isn't that our lives, right? That is your life and that is my life. From the moment of our birth, I was born almost 62 years ago, coming up on my birthday next month in Anaheim, California to a family that the father was employed in the Navy. And so we moved about and I moved with the family, right? And so I'm just going along with things. I, I, I'm somewhere between the beginning of my life and the end of my life. I'm in the middle of my life, right? Am I near the end? Am I just at midway mark? You know, who knows? We're always in the middle, but this language of the 12 tribes scattered, they're in the middle of an adventure. Something's on. <laughs> They've had to leave their home. Implied with this is some conflict. And of course, James leads right out. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. And so it's suggestive of this persecution, this opposition that the early church has faced. And so he's writing as a pastor to a people in the middle of some great adventure that does not feel very great. And so, you know, consider it joy when you encounter the trials. Few of us think of our trials as joyful. Thanks be to God for Pastor James, right? For the pastor who writes this word. Because what, what, what pastors, see, their pastors are less concerned about doctrine. We are concerned about doctrine. I certainly am. I am concerned about the truth. I'm concerned about theology. Again, said that yesterday. You know how much I enjoy theology, right? Hope, hope you know that. But in the pastoral moment, it's less about the doctrine and, and it's more about accompanying people in the day-to-day -day realities of their lives, in the middle, in the muddle, in the mess, in all of the chaos that unfolds in our lives, we receive some medical news. There's a financial reality, a relational tension, uh, a challenge at work. Something happens in the neighborhood. Uh, there's a marriage. There's a divorce. There's a birth. There's a death. All of this stuff, the day-to-day -day living is where the pastors get involved. And so I care about doctrine. I care about theology. I care about the truth passionately and deeply. But at the end of the day, when somebody's in a crisis, when they're in a moment, they don't need a lecture. They need someone to listen, someone to pray, someone to speak the word God, Jesus, hope, life, resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. <clears throat> and so if you've if you're attending Greenwich, either in person or online, you've heard me say in, in recent weeks, one of the beauties of the Easter story, the cross and, and resurrection, uh, the cross and empty tomb, things are not always as they appear to be. To the disciples, that cross was the end of the story. All hope is lost. And so their dreams were shattered. And if they had never heard about the resurrection of Jesus, if somebody had just left and gone away, they might have lived the rest of their life in despair. This one whom we had seen, whom we'd hoped in, is gone forever. And so are my dreams and hopes. But that was not the end of the story. And so, so what pastors do is remind people of the Jesus story, not only the teachings, but the cross and the resurrection. He died there to atone, but he rose. He came back. And so each of us faced the trials of many kinds. And so as pastor James is speaking, 
wherever you are, you have to live faithfully. None of us gets a pass. None of us gets a waiver or an exemption from faithful living and discipleship because life is hard right now. Life is hard for everybody, everywhere. Some of us might be in a smooth sailing season, but just wait, it'll come. The storms arise, right? The scattering happens. And so, and so it's important to understand that James is writing pastorally. As such, he is concerned to communicate clearly in memorable ways. And so like Jesus, he employs word pictures, uh, images, stories, or metaphors, okay? And so uh, in chapter one, uh, when you ask, so everyone who lacks wisdom should ask God, but when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, which is blown and tossed about by the wind. Just a short little image there. Doubt is because we can picture the waves. We've all been to the beach or you've at least seen the picture of waves and they're curling and they're crashing and there's, there's foam and there's spray. And this is what doubt is like. You must believe in the midst of the trial. You must believe. That's the root. That's the call. <laughs> and so Pastor James reminds us and he uses this picture. Don't be blown about. Let there be some anchoring. Um, he talks about the tongue. Um, oh goodness, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. And so, he gives us these images, our little tongue that where our words are formed. He's using the tongue as that, that stand in for our words, our speech, and how important our speech is to our lives and to the, to the life of faith and to community and love and relationships. It's so important, but the tongue is like the bit that goes into the horse's mouth. It's like the rudder of the ship. It's a little spark that can can cause a, a, a great fire. Um, and so there's this wonderful word picture. We'll, 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 we'll dive into that a little more in a few, few weeks. Um, and then he writes this. It's kind of um, very sobering uh, in chapter four. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. You know, kind of talking to people, hey, I don't know where I'm going to land. I'm going to go to that city and I'm going to really make it big, okay? Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. That's that echo of uh, Jesus. Seek first the kingdom. Today has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Very sobering reality. Thank you, Pastor James, for reminding me that I'm here today, gone tomorrow. But that's faithfulness. Pastors remind people that death comes to us all. You know, Ecclesiastes, right? There's a time to be born and a time to die. So let us live this day well. And so our lives are like the morning mist. It's there, it's beautiful, and then... Whew, before you know it, the heat comes and it is gone. So, so James employs throughout this little pastoral letter a number of images, metaphors, word pictures, and the like, speaking to the day-to-day -day realities of a people who are scattered about. So he's speaking to people in many different communities, many different cities, many different places. They're trying to find their way but the reality is your work and your relations and your speech and your prayers and your money, these, the things that comprise our day-to-day -day lives that are not doctrine and theology and all of this stuff, that's where the action is. The action, 
the, 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 it's in the trenches. It's in the day-to-day of our lives. And so thanks be to God for raising up Pastor James uh, to write this letter and to speak to us, we who also are somewhat scattered, right, um, in the middle of some great adventure we call life and trying to be faithful to the God who made us, who loves us, who redeemed us through Jesus Christ. So if you haven't read James, read the whole book. Uh, we'll, we'll take one more crack at some background uh, tomorrow, and then we'll dive into chapter one uh, next week. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the pastoral heart of James. <laughs> yes, he's a theologian. Yes, he saw Jesus. Yes, he knows the reality of, of the truth, but he writes so practically, and so help us to benefit, we who are in the midst of our own lives. And so may these words find their way into the soil of our hearts, and may they lodge there, and may the seed find a good soil that we bring forth a fruit to your glory. And so strengthen us as we get about this day, as we seek to faithfully follow you and serve and love our neighbors. As we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, may the Lord accompany you and bless you, be with you, fill you this day in the midst of your life, this day and forevermore. Amen.